Yeah, cheers, mate. Nice one. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of the RGM podcast with me, Carl Malone, and I'm joined today by a Manchester legend, drummer of the Happy Mondays, Gaz Whelan. Hi, mate. How are you doing? Oh, all right, Carl. How are you, mate? Well, not just the drummer for Happy Mondays. You've obviously got your solo tour and you've got a new single out and all that kind of stuff yourself, which we'll come to. Um, but yeah, just th- thanks for joining us today on the podcast. How are you doing? Oh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, Th- those drummers, eh? Who do they think they are? Stick to the <laughs> Well, <laughs> people might think that, but where do we find you today, mate? You know what? I, I'm, at, if I'm going to sound like a right. I'm, <laughs> well, actually, I'm, in, I'm in the Bahamas, and it sounds it sounds yeah. like it sounds like really glamorous. And it? but it, it's actually not. And I, I live in Canada, so it's not that expensive to come down here. So it yeah. might sound like I'm being, you know, <laughs> but, but it's actually not. And it's been. It's been raining out, and it's ridiculously it. expensive, expensive, outrageous. I mean, really? I mean, oh man! And it's that. It's, it's yeah, uh, yeah. So it's not. It sounds really glamorous, but it's, it's I've actually. Just, I've just been to Isla Mangas, and that were outrageously expensive in some places too. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really, really were. And to, even to get there, were expensive, and. Uh, yeah, the everywhere's expensive. Yes, that's true. Yeah, if it's more than a pound, then it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah, how much? Yeah. <laughs> how much? Yeah, that's my middle name. How much? <laughs> I I have got a friend called Martin Fox that his nickname is How Much, and he and he, he keeps a twenty pound note in his sock, um, just in case there's an emergency. Even though people don't use cash anymore. That's what George Harrison used to do. You know that? Did he really? Go on. Yeah, no. George Harrison used to keep a twenty. He had a pair of shoes that he had a twenty pound note in in yeah. the heel. <laughs> and uh, it's true. And then once the, the Beatles are in some cafe, they never really carried money, obviously, because it was the Beatles. And they're in some cafe somewhere. I think it was when he was doing Magical Mystery. It was when he was doing Magical Mystery Tour. And they got a the food, and the, and the guy then went, Well, where, where's the bill? I want the, you know, and they're like, Well, it's the Beatles, and they're filming you in your cafe. And he went, I want the bill. And they all let him out. And Harrison pulled his way out. I've had this for five years in my shoe and paid the bill. <laughs> oh, that's a good story. That's good. <laughs> yeah, true. No, true. Apparently, so he's, that was in his, his wife's book. So. Oh, okay, so big Beatles fan there. You'll see my jigsaw yeah. of Abbey Road in the, in the back there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. other one over there. That's uh, another jigsaw thing when they were bored in lockdown. Uh, that's, that's like my my rooms full of Beatles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was when I, I mean I, I remember I hadn't got about 1979. How old would it have been? I don't know, twelve or something like that. And I was it was a Christmas day. And we had always had our Christmas dinner at three o'clock one day, and. Uh, <laughs> Me and my brother-in-law moved in with us and we just got my old sister and we was delayed and we said, oh, an hour late, so I put the TV on, BBC Two, and it was Beatles Day, I didn't know, and I thought, oh, oh I don't yeah. like the Beatles, a 12-year-old rebelling. And our days now, I was on, and I was hooked. And, it, and I checked it recently, I went, I'm sure it's 1979, Christmas Day, BBC Two, and I looked it up on Google and it was. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I was hooked, just hooked, I've been hooked ever since, yeah. It's, it's weird, isn't it, though, that the Beatles just grab every, every new group of people, that, every new generation, you know, that nobody can hide from the Beatles. You can't. It's just really weird, you know. And, 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 and it's just really weird. There's something about them, isn't there? There's something really hypnotic about. I don't know what it is. It's one of them real. It's just a perfect storm, and it? it's one of them real freaks of nature, and, <laughs> and let it never happen again. Never has done. Never will. Well, you say that pill stills and belly aches is over thirty years old. I know, you, and you've had music out before that. There's new generations still finding the happy Mondays a little bit. Do you think? Do you think? No, <laughs> turning your nose up. 32 years, Christ, I'm high. Where did it go? Well, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just bizarre. That's, Christ, that's what I met my wife that year. And it's like, yeah, I okay. Know. Well, I've, I've, had, I've had Sean on the on the podcast before. Right. Uh, and, you know, Sean is probably like the perfect guest to have on a, uh, to interview, just because he's, you know, he, he, he what you see is what you get with Sean and it is just like he'll just he'll just say whatever he wants whatever is on his mind at the time and we started getting on about aliens and that stuff like quite quick into the conversation and everything and just like how and, and how creative he is as well with words and all that kind of stuff you know being a drummer and and having that you know person that you've worked with for many many years does it help you with lyrics and that kind of stuff or are you completely separate to um any kind oh, of that like no, he's got he 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 messes with he messes with words. He's got he's kind of one of them uh, who who uh, it's kind of just a natural thing he's got where he just plays with words. So no, my lyrics are completely different. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but no, always lyrics are when I when I, whatever music I listen to, lyrics are things that grab me in. So I went, so growing up with a band, uh, his brother Paul, who's a bass player, who formed the band, started the band. Him and Sean and I found a lot of like. Paul was two, three, two years older than me. Sean's five years older than me. They were a massive influence. I was fifteen when I joined, 
So I think Paul is a musical kind of influencer than Sean. Because we used to write songs as we always wrote songs where we 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 play the music jam and Sean would sit on the floor cross-legged with a microphone scribbling and he and it's usually and so that influence of lyrics was always really good. And it just happens in fits of laughter because there's usually things that were in jokes in the band or stuff that was going on. So we had a good I had a the peers there were really good teachers. They were they, 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 as a youngster, they were two good teachers of music and, and lyrics. So that influenced me massively, yeah. But lyrically, yeah, we're very, very different. Yeah. yeah well, uh, sorry for the loss of Paul as well recently in the band. Yeah. Um, that must have been, you know, a, a big... I know you've announced new gigs with the Appy Mondays and that kind of stuff. Uh, it must be a, a, a massive change to the dynamics of the band, just not having Paul around anymore. It's just weird. He's my best mate. And he, he was his band. He formed the band. He started the band, you know, and he was the driving force behind the band for years. He was always him early on, you know, he was his band. So yeah, it's just, it's just really, it's, it's really, really strange. We've done a few gigs since without him and it's just, it's just different. It's just very different. And yeah, that, 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 that just funny, a couple of nights ago, we talked about him and my wife just said, I just can't believe, still can't believe he's, he's not here. Mm. He's not around. And looking on my messages on my phone, when I was going through and there's a message I'd sent. And the last message, Funny enough, last night I was going through messages because so my top phone messages on my computer, and I looked and I was scrolling through, and there was and my last message to him was, "Are you okay, mate? How are you feeling?" And it just it just kind of free. It's just really weird. And then last night was watching a bit of TV, and Kirby and Fusion Kirby and Fusion came on, Larry David, and he used to Paul used to say, "That's you, that." And he used to call me Gary David. That's you, that's you. And I'm sorry, and it kind of you know it's funny, but it upset me. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's weird, very strange. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. So you, you have played a few gigs recently with him, then? We're, we're, yeah, we've done a few since, yeah. I think we've done three or four since, yeah. And how was that, like, transition as a... Very strange, very, strange. very, very yeah. strange. I, even, yeah. I can imagine because it's Sean's brother as well. I know you're best mate too. It, it must have been strange for everybody, the whole, like, even you know, like what, walking what, up to what, the stage and not having him there. What was weird is the actual gigs, you get caught up in the gig and you're doing the gig and you're kind of focusing on what you're doing. It was on the journey home after the gigs. Mark Day just said to me, Mark Day, the guitarist, just said, it seems weird because we used to stop after stop every 45 minutes so Paul could have a cigarette. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> and Mark said, we're getting home too early. It just seems weird not stopping that. I mean, kind of, we both got a bit upset. It kind of, ups, it kind of hit us home when the adrenaline had dropped and we was on our way home. So it kind of kicked in more, yeah. Oh, man. No, well, uh, I just wanted to officially say sorry for your loss. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. Commiserations yeah. to everybody there. So I, I've been having a nose in, uh, just having a nose of your socials a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, I noticed you, you, you'd had a good write-up, nice booze-up with Manny in, in Barbados recently. <laughs> he's here, yeah. He's here. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, Is he there? I've not seen him tonight. He's, he's, he's staying to sort of calm. We have oh, been out for yeah. nights with him. We're still recovering. We had a quiet night last night. Was that with him Friday? Last Sunday, <laughs> Friday. We spoke to, I think we're going out with him tonight as well. Okay, right. But yeah, he's with family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all old friends. Is he slowing down? <laughs> <laughs> not really, no. And he's, he's a few years older than me as well. I think he's about three or four years older than me. But no, he never changes. I've not seen him for a few years, to be honest with you. Yeah, okay. But yeah, so it's me him and Colts, who, who I rent a house with. It was for snow patrol, so it was like from Burnley. Oh, yeah. We're all old, we're all old mates. Him and Coxie and uh, and Manny are really good friends. Oh, yeah, well, I've, I've, uh, I've had a few boozy nights recently, just been out and about, and it, it's it's not good, is it? The recovery period <laughs> anymore. I, yeah, and I've never been one that usually suffers some angles. I'm not. Uh, I, I enjoy drinking. I've always been a kind of a weekend drinker or a kind of yeah. On top of drinker, but I don't go mad. I'm not into spirits and all that. I'm a Right. I like Guinness. I like red wine. And I like Guinness. So I kind of think with Guinness. I'm actually I've not had Guinness because it's no probably not. I'm not even seen on the island here. Uh, so I, I'm all right if you stick to Guinness. It's like it's like liquid ganja, isn't it? So it's, it's okay. Don't get an angle. <laughs> I, I had some red. I had some red lot wine last night, and yeah, uh, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get old, when you get in your fifties, it catches up with you. Yeah. I'm 44, mate, and it, the fucking heart horrendous things. It is you when you get in your forties. If, if, if you go yeah. a bit too far with it. Which is, I, I've always found it's, it's a nightmare to know my limits still, even at my age now, I still don't know my limits. I need, I need, I need Kirsty to me, missus, just to tell me when my limits are, and I won't agree with her, ever. No. We don't, I, we don't learn, do we? It's, it's, it's a thing we support when we grow up. Isn't it? <laughs> we don't, I mean, but I, I got back to go back to Manchester next week, and then I've got these solo gigs, and I'm just going to go on the wagon, I'm just not going to, because it's, I don't so much get angles, I just get tired the day after, just like, can't be honest yeah. doing anything. 
just can't be bothered and that's no good you know what I mean I've got to get my arse in gear so I'll go on the wagon next week <laughs> yeah fair enough well enjoy your last few days of Barbados Bar- Barbados man have, have a good in there so uh, I know um, like, like so like when you uh, how did you like how did your journey into just going back and rewinding a little bit how did your journey uh, into music happen you know as, as a as a younger lad uh, well talk us through that I started about eight years of age. I had an older sister who was three years older than me. When I was eight, she was 11. I was I really wanted to be in, in a band when I was eight. Football was my first love, but music, I wanted to be in a band. And I wanted to learn guitar. So me and my sister used to go for classical guitar lessons yeah. once a week. Then the days where you didn't have guitar teachers, you'd learn classical guitar or you'd learn it at school. There was no there was no going learning rock guitar. But of course, I wanted to play, you know, I wanted to be like, uh, you know, whatever, T-Rex, a bit before my time, I was only eight, but, you know, I was on top of the pop slate or whatever, whoever it was at the time. But, you know, I don't know, but uh, I wanted to be, and I didn't, and I was, wasn't very studious, my sister was really good, and we did that for three years. Then I was at 11, I had a really bad accident, nearly lost my arm, mm-hmm. and uh, lost all the feeling in my arm for seven years, and my arm struggled to grow, really bad traumatic action, and I never kind of recovered. And then when I was 15, 16, and then punk happened when I was in hospital, and my mum bought, my mum and dad bought me, never mind the bollocks of cess pixels when I came out of hospital, I was in Salford Royal for a while, came out and they bought me that. I think the pistols had even split up by then, I was still I was still 11. And then uh, this, the scarfing happened, I went to see the specials, and that just, when I was like 13, 14, uh, and then Paul Wright, and then 15, there was a girl at school who had an older sister who was getting married to Sean, and I got and Mark Day's younger brother was in my age, and just got caught into it, just got dragged into it, and then uh, and that was it. And I just and, and then I discovered the Beatles, and then and, but music was was an obsession from from the Sex Pistols when I was eleven, really. It's it's weird with music, and it it grabs you. You don't really choose it sometimes. Mm. It feels like yeah. that with you too. Completely, and and, and my, my parents were huge music fans, and me. me my dad worked away a lot. He was an electrician. My mum worked nights in a psychiatric hospital. And then my nan, my mum's mum, brought us up a lot. And she'd been a singer in the clubs around Manchester. And she always, always had music on. And my dad always had gospel and rock and roll on. So it was always around, you know, we, constantly. It was always the house. It was always full of music. Always. And we always had, it's funny because we had a piano in the house. And my sister went on to play piano. Uh, my day had a piano in the house. Uh, the riders had a piano in the house. So it's, it's common how you're growing up. You people seem to have pianos in the house or something, yeah. So they kind of like took you under the wing and started the journey in this band. Were you always called the Happy Mondays or did you have any like shitty names before or like that? I always like to think. When we first formed, we were called uh, Avant Garde. <laughs> nice. Because it was all the best one. And, and to this day, we still argue. We don't, we, this, this is pure Mondays, this. We don't know whether we call called Happy Mondays or the Happy Mondays. We still argue about it. We've, known, we've, yeah. never, we've never settled on either, so we don't know what we are. What's it say on the album covers? Have you checked them? I can't. I, I haven't a clue. <laughs> we'll do it. It's probably different each one. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. It was, it was actually it was Paul Ryder who came up with the name. He was in a pub yeah. in uh, '82, and he was uh, the song by Echo and the Bunnymen called "The Cutter." And there's a there's a breakdown in the middle eighty when it drops it goes and by the Happy Loss, and we thought it said Happy Laws. So Paul Ryder said, "Let's call ourselves the Happy Laws," and we had that for five days. And Paul Ryder went, "No, I changed Laws to Mondays," and that was it. There's been lots of myths about whether well, that's where the game came from. I remember it. Did you ever play any gigs? Quite lucid. Uh, Avant Garde. Pardon? Did you have you ever played any gigs under Avant Garde? Did one when I'd for, in 1982, so it was like <laughs> 80, 82, 80, 82, 83. I think I'd just just left school in the local community centre. It was quite weird because the worst rehearsal room we, we rehearsed in was in a primary school. And it, the room we rehearsed in was a le- room I'd learned to read and write in. And I learned to play drums and be in a band in that room. And then the first gig was at the community centre, which had been the community centre where I'd gone as a kid as a, in nursery. So it's really, really, really strange. You know, so, I, yeah, so there was kind of a... So there's them links from my childhood in the band or, or from the start. <laughs> so one gig is Avant Garde, and then the names yeah. changed to the Happy Mondays. So how quick did it, like, how, how long were you, like, just playing the local circuits and stuff without, before things started to like pick up and that. How long? I think we did our first gig in 82, then kind of about eight, probably about five or six years. We did a lot of, yeah. a lot of touring bits, doing lots of little gigs. And I can't remember when Factory got interested. Phil Sachs became our manager and then he was friends with Mike Pickering at Factory. I think that's probably about 86, 87, probably about four or five years. Yeah, about 86, I think four years before Factory. And then we started doing tours with, we had a tour with the Colourfield, Terry Hill, New Order, James. 
uh, the Weather Prophets, did some quite a few tours. We did lots, lots of, of you know, playing over the toilets, as they call them. So did it still all start to pick up after, you know, signing to Factory then and having this relationship with Tony Wilson? Yeah, because, I mean, Mike Pickering should get a lot more credit because he was a kind of signed us at Factory, he's was A&R man. And yeah, I think we got put on, in them days, kind of indie bands, if you want to use that phrase, in, they all wore winkle pickers and all had black coats on, were all very, you know, all very kind of uh, monochrome, it was all that kind of thing. And obviously we didn't look like that. And uh, I remember the farm were around as well, they didn't look like that. And But because we was on Factory, we'd get put on gigs and people just, Curious because who's this new factory band? And most people at Factory didn't like us. Mike Pick Champion does. A girl called Tracy Donnelly did, and then uh, who worked at Factory. And then Tony Wilson didn't even take a serious at first. And then when he, then he did, he, he just gave us everything. You know what I mean? So, so our curiosity just because we signed to Factory. Uh, yeah, we got people coming look, look at us. I mean, we had we'd had uh, we'd sent cassettes off, which you did in them days, or Parada did. And London Records came to see us in our rehearsal room, and someone put a brick through the window and put them off halfway through but they said to us we're interested we think you've got potential as a band but you need to get an image like and they actually said you've got no image what what you're dressing like what would you what you dress like on stage you we went well just like this baggy they went, clothes. yeah they went but it wasn't baggy then it's kind of they went you look like football hooligans or mormons or something it's really weird they had this weird perception of us and we're like what do you want to dress like and they said well don't you can't you get an image like culture club and we just all went <laughs> i can't imagine that I can imagine and, and i remember and i remember derek who was uh John and Paul's dad, who was looking managers at the time, said they've got back in touch and they said they will sign us if we change our image. And unanimously, we all just went, "No, yeah. we're not doing it. No, no." And I'm glad we didn't. Which I and ironically, the the, the A and R guy who came to see us signed us on Pike signed us. He moved to publishing, signed us on a publishing deal a few years later. <laughs> it's right. a funny old world of music industry. I, I can remember like uh, I was speaking to Dermo recently from North Northside. Yeah. And he was just saying, you know, he, did, he didn't really deal with Tony Wilson a lot, but it was, the team around him really supported him and helped him get in and get onto tour slots, which it sounds like a similar kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. thing that happened with you guys too. Yeah, yeah. And our friend Macca managed them for a while, yeah. No, we had a good, we had a close ratio. I got on, me and Paul Ryder especially got on with Tony Wilson really well uh, and became friends really, really close to him. Uh, so yeah, so we we did it. We did have a, actually in the early days we probably didn't have much contact with him. He was always out and about, Tony. But I think later on we did. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it was funny because at Factory, there was we used to go in the place that I've seen downstairs called the Gay Trader Bar. A lot of the bands and people in the in music actually used to go down there. It's kind of away from the club upstairs, like a little bar. And so a lot of Factory used to hang around there. A lot of people at Factory Records and. Who were, were, were Man City fans and me and Wilson and other Man United fans. So we, we used to always, me and, Milt, me and Tony would argue with Rob Gretton and a few others who were blues and all that. So we kind of got friends because of that as well. Yeah. We used to see him at United because Tony Wilson had a season ticket at United. So. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So, you know, the, the band started to pick up. You're doing, you're, you're out on the road a lot. You're doing your tours and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. How, how was the relationships, uh, how, how did life on the road affect the band? Because I know... It can go. It can go. It can go either way. When once, once you're on the road and you're in everybody's pockets forever, and, and there's no escape sometimes for people. How, how yeah, was it in life for you and the band? But early on, until the kind of success, really, everything we were proper. We were just like a group of mates. It was really yeah. close. We had our we, we we had our own kind of in in taught language. It, you know, we had we all got we all had a similar sense of humour. All really, 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 really close. Uh, really close. You know, and, and very similar sense. And it was funny because when I, when I joined the band at 15 and, and it was Paul and Sean, it was the first time I kind of felt really kind of um, at home. It's kind of, had to, I, I kind of fit in it as well. I've always, I always had lots of friends, but I always at the same time felt a bit of an outsider. And when I met them, I think they were the kind of the same. They had lots of friends and fitting, but they always felt a little bit like outsiders. And back in them days, the early 80s, being in a band, people would question you, are you in a band? <laughs> you know, it was all like, that was the students and people in South Manchester. No, not in Salford, you know, there weren't that many and it was kind of questionable. So I, so we all got really, really well. And it's kind of like when you, it's really after the, the pressures of when you had a bit of success and, you, and you're constantly touring. And then, you know, and 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 you kind of, you, you all have your own girlfriends and wives, you kind of get your own friends and you all kind of go your own different directions. We all had our own different drugs. And yeah. you kind of start just growing apart a little bit, and then you come together, and you grow apart. It's it's like it's like a marriage, you know. And I know people, I know it's a cliche, but it really is, you know, it really is. 
and it becomes, you know, an inside. It's, you start, you know, irritating each other a little bit, and then it's good when you when we reformed and older, you kind of become more accepting of the little, you know, you don't the little things that irritate you. You just go, you know, well, that's just we're just different people, you know, or we're very similar but different, you know, uniquely the same, you know. So you just kind of accept it, and that's why I think when bands reform, they said tend to get on better. Yeah, you uh, kind of just grow up. Yeah, but it's fast because there's different things that come into a, a band relationship, isn't there? You know, we, we cover the yeah. journey of a band many, we've, we've done it with many different bands on RGM over the years and, you know, different, yeah, you, you have different relationships yourself with people and family and you have yeah. children and that kind of stuff. And the dynamics of the band are always changing, particular when you, mm. you get a bit older, I suppose. Yeah, um, no, we do. We do, we do. It's, 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 you have to work. It's like any workplace, you know, no matter workplace, people, yeah. you're falling out of people, people annoy you, then you make up and everything's great. And, but, you know, for the most part, we've, we've we've been all right, you know. No band, no band, no. I don't think any bands are straightforward. It's it's uh, no. like any group of work people. Well, you know, having this, because when I was speaking to Sean, the the tunes, the Happy Monday tunes, are so complex and dynamic and fresh and new. Right at the start, how did how did how was that as a drummer in the band? Um, connecting with that kind of sound, I don't really know what I'm trying to say. It, it, yeah, no, no, it sounds like, I, it, sounds I, like I, it was hard work. I didn't really see myself as as a drummer. We were kind of like me, Paul, and Mark were like, and PD, the keyboard player, were like about. It was all about writing music and getting mm. done uh, And so drums was kind of what I'd fall into by accident because of my accident, my arm, I couldn't play guitar, so I just picked drums up. So I quite enjoyed playing drums, but it was never my passion, you know, songwriting and, yeah. and the music was. And it was it was it was interesting because me and uh Paul were really into uh soul music. He was really into folk, he was into real soul music and dance music and Northern Soul had been a big a big thing before our time. But as a little kid I used to see all the Northern Soulers going up to Wigan and Blackpool and stuff and and so soul music was always around. So we, even though we were kind of seen as an indie band, if you like, and Mark was really into like rock guitar and big guitar, we were the bass and drums. We were always wanted to sound like the JB's, James Brown, or, or or kind of soul bands or funk bands mixed with say the Bunny Men or something. So we all it was always about groove rules and funk always, even though and we didn't do it, but not playing it. We didn't, we didn't. We, it was kind of like a punk funk thing, so we wanted to do. We never wanted to be, if we ever got too tight, we'd go, oh, you know, we don't want to sound like level 42, level 42, you know what I mean? So it was always very loose and very kind of, you know, if the Rolling Stones were a funk band, that's kind of, or the Doors were a funk band, that's what we were kind of aim, aiming for. Subconsciously, it was nothing was ever planned, everything was always really organic. There was nothing cynical or cerebral about it. It was always like, we just, it just, it, that was just how it was. We never discussed what direction it was going in. Being poor into disco, soul, funk. And that's what we did, you know. Well, I, I personally went to see the Upper Mondays. I must have been 10 years, 10 times over the years. Probably the first one, I think it was the Octagon in Sheffield, in the early 90s. The last one was probably Tramlines Festival a couple of years ago, or just after COVID when we saw you on the big stage and stuff like that. And the, the, the difference now compared to some of the performances over the years, because sometimes it was a little bit hit and miss what kind of, what you were going to get from the band, weren't it? How, how did you find that kind of? Uh... Yeah, I was hit and miss. It was funny. We saw, we used to say it was like, you know, probably 60, 70% of the time we were good and 30% wasn't. Now we're pretty 90%. We used a pretty good. Time. And I think probably just because to get older, you just can't, you know, you don't party as much. You don't, uh, you know, sometimes you turn up, you know, drunk for the night before or drunk, and you don't take it seriously, you know, just a, just a kid. And now you're older, you, you you just take it a little bit more serious. And and it's hard because it's a fine line. You don't want to become too professional and lose kind of what yeah. you know, what you're about. But you still but you still want to be able to, you know, pick, you know it's, 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 it costs a lot of money to go to a gig. And, people, and it's funny because right? you don't really appreciate how important the gig is to people, to the crowd. You just think they just turn up, you know. Until I like when I, when I, when the band's in town, I'm really lucky. Like Echo and the Bunny were in town, in, when I, I live in Toronto a while back, and all week I was really excited. And you don't really appreciate, you don't think about it when you're in the eye of the storm. So yeah, yeah you just kind of yeah, don't, don't take it more seriously. Just more, you're more professional, for want of a better word. Yeah, like I say, it's a fine line. You don't want to be too professional, you know. And just, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, so you, you always got, to be, and, and we never will be anyway, because once we're, you know. Once we got on stage, it's kind of always there's always anything could happen, but 
you know, pretty well together. It was it, it was always an event, an Happy Mondays gig. It, 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 it was very fond in my childhood because the crowd were worse for wear as well. <laughs> it wasn't just the band that was sometimes a bit hammered. <laughs> you know, the, the the crowd was always fun too. A lot of that it was in them days, wasn't it? I think I think the times have changed now. It's it's kind of you, you can't be as it's just difficult d- d- different days now. But yeah, well we're, we're we're essentially a punk band, you know. Yeah, yeah no, it, it's great. I've just fond memories of you know looking back. How, how do you look back on uh, on, uh, on the band now? You you know you're doing your solo stuff. How, how do you how do you look band on back on? Years. I know you still. I know there's still plenty to come from the Happy Mondays. But if you, if 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 it had ended now and you were looking back on it, how would you summarise it? Uh, I don't, you know, we're, we're just live on. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know. It's kind of difficult when you. Uh, I always thought we could have achieved more. Mm. Uh, but then when I think about it, we we achieved a lot more than what we expected to. We expected just to put a record out and. Do a few gigs, and you know, if I'm honest, you know, we started in '82, still doing gigs now, and I, it, it, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Think about it, considering like in the '80s, there were a lot of bands who were a lot more commercially successful than us, and, and are not earning a living now from it. So, mm. so yeah, really, I'm you know, trying to sound, uh, you know, I, 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 really lucky. I think just lucky, yeah. you know, lucky, and it is. There's luck in everything we've we've all, you know. But also, you, you got to be. You gotta, you, I think that I think the trick is to be different, and we didn't try to be different. We just were, we were just lucky. It's just I, to make, up, you know, just to make up with the band. It just. I speak to many musicians, and and to have a career in music and have enough money to come in and pay the rent is like the holy grail in it, really. And not uh, and not have a proper job and just you know be creative and have that um, passion in your life that you love, um, and and it pays the way it must be great yeah i mean sometimes <laughs> sometimes stupid i remember saying to my brother sometimes i crave a proper job just to, because yeah. of because of because of routine when you've got no routine yeah. in life, i know I'm, just, I'm not i'm not complaining for a second but when you know, over the years like i heard people like say to me, it's because you've had no routine in your life that's why you have about the, this and that or whatever and and there's, there's some truth in that you know routine's good for humans you know yeah. and not having it in a band uh I sound like a complainer, and I'm not. And then my brother said, "Yeah, you try a routine your life for four to five weeks and see if you still like it." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah that's true, you know, you know." But yeah, yeah, really, really lucky, really, really lucky. But you know, it's like it's that thing of when you're in a gig and these thousands of people enjoying it, you see that one person walk out, you're like, "Why is he walking out?" You know? Yeah, these <laughs> But yeah, really lucky. But yeah. it just, I think. Someone asked me, I, I did a panel a while back at a, a music. I, I manage a band and they re- literally committed for the last two years. They rehearse six days a week. Uh, sorry, six nights a week they rehearse. So they have Sunday off, but they rehearse six nights a week or five nights a week and gig every night. And they said they're really committed. Why aren't they making it? Why aren't they getting anywhere? And I said, why are they rehearse at night time? So they've all got jobs. I went, where are they going? Mm. So you can't have a job and do it. And he went, well, it's easy for you. And I said, you can't. You've got. You, you can't. You've you've got to live and breathe it twenty four hours a day. And we did. We had. We we used to rehearse every day. We used to go in the rehearsal room and we'd spend. We used to get there at twelve. We'd stay till late at night, seven hours. Probably only rehearse for an hour, but we're together in the rehearsal room doing. And you've got. You just got to commit everything to it. You've just got. To, you've got to live, sleep, and breathe it twenty four hours a day. You really have. You've got to really commit to it. Uh, and it's very different now. You know, times are just very different. But that's what you've got to do. And I still do. You know, me. I'm constantly reading books on music, watching documentaries on music, listening to music. You've just got to be obsessed by it. Yeah, well, I've, got, I've got a travel guitar on with me. I couldn't come away for a week without bringing a guitar on me. I've got yeah. you know. What kind of bands are you listening to at the minute? Are they uh, new bands or is it older music? What 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 what, what, what are you listening to at the minute, mate? You know what? I, very rarely I listen to new bands. Someone sends us some. I, I, get, I get sent a lot of stuff, and there is some that are really good. Most. Most of it just sound like Oasis or, you know, I get things like saying, get on this, a front man's got loads of attitude. And I kind of go, well, I've kind of been done that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I listen to, a, I kind of listen to a lot of old stuff. I've been listening to a lot of it. I listen to a lot of Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen's kind of my thing. Kind of like that kind of stuff. But I listen to, I've been listening to, uh, 
What have I listened to this week? A lot of old, a lot of gospel. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of soundtracks. Been listening to a lot of Morricone here. Uh, all the soundtracks from Spaghetti Westerns, which I love. Uh, even watch some a broad range. Every always a broad range. Always a broad range of of, of uh, music. I was listening to last night's Land of Family Stone early on, and yeah, all, always a a really really broad range of music. Not, not I don't. I'm, it's funny because I, I rarely listen to indie music. Never really have done. Don't really. Uh, I, I run this magazine thing called RGM and I just don't have time to listen to music. It's the worst part about running a magazine. Really? You've got a team of people that write the reviews. A lot of people say, what do you think about it? I'm just like, honestly, mate, I do work full time myself and uh, I manage like 15 writers and trying to get content oh, out every day for the magazine and that kind of stuff. So we've got a team of people to listen to the music. If, if, if I can grab five minutes and I'm in the shower, I'll stick a song on. Um, but it, it's the worst thing about the job is not having time to listen to music because that's where the that's where the beauty is, isn't it? You know, I, I like learning things that are different. And it's and, yeah. and I think it's difficult to be different these days. That's a that's a yeah. that's a thing. You know, I like when it when I go and see something they're like, oh well, that's really different. You know, whether it's you know, I got kind of like the gig I keep missing that I want to see is Spiritualize. So just probably, probably my favorite band. I, I, I just love Spiritualize. In Ashcroft, I'd like to see I keep missing. So kind of, yeah, I'm, on, I'm an old fart now, you know what I mean? Like you kind of get to the point where there's, there's some young, you know, there's a lad who's, who's supporting us on some of his solo gigs called uh, Shea Coates, and he's got a band called Twins. So he's like kind of really old school uh, acoustic. I kind of like, I kind of like <laughs> miserable music. I like, I like raw stuff, but kind of lyric, more lyric, lyrical content, more kind of cerebral sort of stuff. But, yeah, no, sound, soundtracks, I like big scores, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Nice, okay. Well, well, not, you know, and sometimes someone said me in my go, oh, they're, they're really different. <laughs> I can't think of a topic, but I've been listening to you yeah, lately. I've just, I've, I've, the, in, in the last week, I've had the new Deja Vega album, they're from Manchester, and uh, yeah. their, their vinyl's just arrived after like a year of trying to get it <laughs> printed. Get it pressed through the vinyl. People, it got and all that kind of stuff. That just come through. That was nice. The new Arctic Monkeys album. I'm, I'm really enjoying. I never wasn't a fan of the early stuff, but the the new stuff is just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, um, a band called Buzzard, Buzzard, Buzzard. I'm listening to their album. They're good. Um, just loads of variety out there. There is, a, there is a lot of, and I've been, and I've been uh, told about like you know people think there's a bit of a Manchester curse where. You kind of hold it on to the older days and the the, the bands are mm. like oasis copies or you know and that kind of there's a lot yeah. of that about in manchester at the minute and there is a bit of a swell and feeling from the manchester music community like photographers and everybody that i've got a gigs with down uh down in the northern quarter where you know they're a bit bored of that and they want a new wave of stuff to come mm. out so it, they, they want manchester to do better there and not hold back to the on the past a little bit how do you feel about that I agree with you completely. That's what I'm saying about I get sent loads of stuff and yeah. and I listen to it and I go, that's really good, but it just, just sounds like Oasis. Or it's just, the amount of front men who sound like Liam, and I can understand it because, you know, Liam's a great front man, you know. But, like, people... John Lydon's a great front man and people kind of were inspired, you know, Liam or whatever, you know, or, or Ian Brown were inspired by John Lydon, but they don't sound exactly like him. They do their own thing, you know what I mean? So I think, I think there's just two... Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. I, I think, I don't know if it's me being visible, I find, I don't know how you feel about this, and I, could, I could be wrong, but I think that the old setup of bass, drums, keyboards, guitar, and singer, it's been done for 60, 70 years now, and it's hard to do anything that's different. So when you see someone doing something, I think the, 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 old, the old setup of a band, you know, it's... You know the front man with with you know with the uh, the attitude, the bass player who's chill, the drummer who's wacky, you know the guitarist who's an introvert. It's like it's kind of old hat now, and like, uh, and it's hard to do something different and get a new sound just with them instruments. So far, you know that's why. So it's always interesting. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's hard to find something yeah. different in a clash of you know mixing mixing. Yeah. Someone said if you, uh, I remember what I was saying about what one of the music conferences said. If you got a advice for, for bands <laughs> shouldn't be asking us but <laughs> I said, well, we used to have cassettes on our tour bus and it would range from johnny cash to public image to sly and the family stone to jo james brown to uh soundtracks to uh nat king cole to right across the board you know to film scores from you know right you know you, you yeah. couldn't everything and i think you 
if you can get a band, and it's always been my kind of thing, and I try to do it with soul stuff at the moment, and it's hard, get a band that's a mixture, a band that sounds like your record collection. So when you go to a gig, you're not in a 10 songs, 12 songs that all sound the same, which is, which is also can be good, mm. but if you go and listen to someone's record collection, so it's different. Each, there's a running theme, but, you know, the, that one's a bit rocky, that one's a little bit, you know, so it's like a more, so it's like... A, I'm sounds sound a bit pretentious here. So it's been more of a journey and a, and a, and a, and a yeah. film, a, a, like a movie, a film, movie, film. You know, so there's something interesting. So it's, it's something challenging, something more, I keep saying cerebral, but you know what I mean? So instead of it's just like first note fresh and it ends in fresh. So, it, I mean, Townsend was really good at that. And I, and then you kind of, but then again, you start wandering into the, the you know the dodgy area of rock operas, which you don't want to do. Hmm. But I think, it's, I think nowadays, you, people don't just listen to music. You don't. You rarely see people just listening to music. They've got to be on the phone, or they've got to be doing. It's, it's become like a, you know, people do two or three things at once. I'm even guilty of it, you know. So I think when you got a gig, something's got to be visual as well, uh, and it's got to be. And I think that's what's great about the Who, we, we, because they were so visual. And Townsend was was an art, and it's and it's an art. And if a lot of Manchester bands used to, that's all about Tony Wilson and even the Smiths. They weren't afraid to be Mancunian and arty. He's like, no, oh, you can't do that, you're pretentious. Not, they, 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 you know, they didn't care. And Tony Wilson would slap you in the face of it and say, I don't care for being pretentious. And I think it should be, I think, you know, punk rock was art as well, you know, even though it was, for, and it was really, I think it was a most pure form of art. It was from the from the heart and not the mind, you know. And I, But I just think a gig should be something, an experience rather than just a concert. And I don't mean, you know, Backing dancers or you know, I mean, it should be just somewhere where you walk away going, you know, what happened there? What was that? Mm. You know, where it's not like I've just been to see ten songs. Yeah. It should be like, well, it's a performance or something. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm probably not articulating this way, but you know, like, it's just something. I know, I, I, I know what you mean. There's the, the technology is a lot different these days. It's not that. Well, I say it, it's not that. I know everybody's skint at the minute, but. It's not that expensive to maybe try something different, a projector or something. I, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head what what could make hmm. something different than just five boys and leather jackets yeah. to play a few songs. Well, I'm trying to like, projectors and all that start getting complicated. It's hard. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> you know, we, we run backing tracks. It's only me and Mike, two of us at the moment. It might be three yeah. of us. But then you, the syncing it all up, it gets all, then it start, and you know, especially playing little venues. You not got time and sound checks, but yeah. But I think what we're go- what we're going to do when I'm, when I'm doing my solo gigs, we're going to do a thirty minute slot electric. Me, and, me, me, my partner Mike, who's a great electric guitarist, I play acoustic electric. We do. Is it Mike do B? Pardon? Is it Mike B. Mike B. Yeah. So yeah, we, no, we, I've, I've seen it when he when he did a few gigs with Wenatchee. Um, I, I know lovely him. Lovely, yeah, lovely, lovely lad. Now. A great because I'm just a rim guitarist. He's a great lead guitarist, and he's really good. So and we'll have that in a backing track, and we've got the back. So we'll probably do. Eight half an hour, probably mostly Love and the Family Tree, my songs, and maybe a couple of Mondays ones in there. And then we'll sit down and do acoustic and Q and A, pure Monday songs. But in that electric set, we'll probably have links in between each songs, so that it's not a gap. Ding, song finishes. Wait, you call it. To, there'll be some sort of background, something going on, something to keep it. So it's not just to keep attention, just just so the, it, it's it's it, it, it's thirty minutes of entertainment rather than thirty minutes of eight songs or whatever it is. I bet I'm probably not explaining it probably, but I just think it should be. People should go away going, you know, what was that? Or you know, it's an experience. It's like going to the cinema, going to the picture cinema, pictures. You know, going to, you know, it should be, it should be like that. Coming, I go, wow, that was a great experience. Or, or even just have more conversations as a band on what more can they do to be different. I think. Mm. I think everybody, yeah. it feels like these young bands just settle into a role. Oh, I'm the bassist, so I'm just going to be all chilled in the corner. I'm, a, I'm the drummer. I'm going to be a bit weird. Um, <laughs> you know. we never like that. We were we were all yeah. very, we were like a group of people. It yeah. some kind of irrelevant almost. Mm. You know, it's like we were just a group. I, and I agree. And I, yeah, I agree. And I think now they've, they've, they've gone into this thing of audience participation. All right, you know, Jim Morrison would be turning in his grave. Yeah. You know, and it's and I, I get that as well. You know, this kind of it's just very different. But I think they should be entertaining, but. Everything's about selling point now, you know, and, and yeah. you know, I never get on stage and say, go and buy my merch. I don't know. That's not the, you know, oh, it grind. It, it gets on my nerves when bands list fucking social media pages. 
Oh, you know, I, I don't know anybody that's ever thought, oh, I'll go on Twitter now when they've <laughs> when they've said, this is my Twitter band. You can get me on Instagram. You can get me on Facebook. You can get me on. Everybody switches off to that because it's fucking. Just, did it? Well, I, 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 that, I, that's, I, how I, that's how I feel. That I, I've never reacted to it. And when, I, when I'm putting gigs on and band, I've seen many bands do it. I just think there's no point doing that. Just give them. Give them a flyer or something to scan or something later on in their own yeah, yeah. time. They're not going to do it there and then at the gig. And if, if they do, what's, what, what they're going to do, really? Yeah, name of the band's enough. You know, if they like it, they'll go and find it. If they don't, yeah. you know, and I, I, you know, I don't get a button. It's a, we used to get that when we were signed to Electric Records America. American bands are, would go, you know, they go stand outside and sell the merch afterwards and, you know, do yeah. all that. And we, we, we never turn up for, to do anything like that. And it was interesting because... I had a conversation, I think it was Tony once about it, and he was reading something, and they were saying that, and it was interesting that in, in what the difference between, there was, this, there was this, what's the difference between American bands and British bands? And the indifferent thing was, American bands learn their instruments and form a band, British bands form a band and learn their instruments. That was <laughs> difference number one. Number two is when rock and roll, in, in, in America, rock and roll, because of the way America is, it's, it's, a, it's a business. And it is a business. We're not kidding ourselves, it's a business. It's a music business, show business, whatever you call it. But in UK, it's still seen as an art form to the detriment of English bands when they go to America, whether it's the Kinks, whether it's us, whether it's Oasis, whether it's, you know, because you don't want to play the game because it's art, you know, well, you know, and young bands don't do it anymore. They play the game. I, you've got, there's, 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 there's somewhere in the middle of compromise that can be found, I think, where yeah. you can play the game without being, without selling your soul. And it started because in this 50s, late 50s, when American bands came touring Britain, the only place with rock and roll, the only place where they could play was at art colleges, hence Lennon saw them, and Townsend saw them, and uh, Ray, Ray and Dave Davies saw them. So there's that kind of claps and all them, you know, all that. Where they all saw them at art colleges, so there's always an art form to it. And I think that still should should be the way. And, that, and that's the difference. But it doesn't help you sell your products, and you know I won't. I'm very cautious on Twitter. About, I'm cautious. I can't sell myself or even someone says something real nice, and you've got to retweet. And I'm like I'm not comfortable doing that. And I've kind of got better at it. <laughs> even doing, talking to the to the camera, I've got better because you've got to do it, and that's fine. But I won't oversell myself. The, the, you hear like I, I have young bands. I say, listen to this. What it sound like? We're the greatest band in the world. We're going to be bigger than. Voice <laughs> is like it's been done, mate. I've heard that a million times. You know. Oh. And this conference with the greatest band in the world, you know, are you? You know, I, I, they'll, they'll prove to me. And then, but you don't have to be the greatest band in the world. It's not a competition. Yeah. And this thing like it's a competition, it's not. You know, Oasis lost a lost competition to Blur. Did it do them any harm? The Stones lost it to the Beatles. Did it do them any harm? It's not a competition. Forget that. Just do your own journey. Yeah. yeah I'm just, I, had a little rant, I had a little rant there, haven't I? Yeah, I like that. I like that, it's mate. And everything goes to the lie down, you know. <laughs> Let's have a beer. <laughs> Let's have a drink and uh, relax oh, a little bit now. And then we'll, yeah. we'll get on to your stuff now, eh? Oh, oh, old, man, old man screams at the clouds, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so obviously you've got your new single out yourself. Um, uh, so, how how do you describe your new single, Black Symphony? Symphony. I can't speak today. Symphony. How would you describe? Old man with lots of, you know what? It, it, <laughs> it's kind of a again. I had I got a couple of people got in touch and say you got to do this, do that. If you want to get in the charts, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. Uh, and I've not promoted it. I, in the new year, I'm going to bring a single out in February, and I, I might start doing vinyl and take it more. I've always just started taking it serious. Yeah. And I just put them out there for people. I do no, I do very little bits of promo like this. I've got no team behind me. I don't do a big sale. I just put it on Disto Kid on Bandcamp. Don't do anything like that. And people say, "Well, what do you expect then?" And and they're right. You know, I won't. But I'll just, I'll just, just see. You know what happens. I'm not. And and they, you can't just see put something out and see what happens because it won't happen. But I'm, I'm luckily to be in a position where I, I can do a bit of that. I'm just doing it for the music at the moment. It will change, and it will start selling my soul a little bit more. But there's, I, I know how to do it without. It's it's a song of, uh, of you know people say well I've got no you know did a thousand things wrong so I've got no regrets it brought I've got thousands of regrets <laughs> thousands everybody but, has yeah, bullshit it, it, when they say that yeah yeah of course you are <laughs> and it's a song about regret there's a song about and it's about uh, and being a, a miserable uh, <laughs> you're a spoiled musician you know <laughs> about I, I kind of like I. You know, you focus on stupid things. When I was like 18, all my friends were going off holiday to Spain and Greece, and I couldn't because I was in the band. And we do, you know, the band's been one big fucking holiday, you know what I mean? So I can't complain. But you, I kind of miss, I can't, you kind of think you missed out on things. I haven't, but I've had a lucky life, you know, I'm not at all. And just kind of bits of regret and how I think I would have done things differently, you know. Uh, I might have done all right, so it's fine, but I, I think I could have just done for a lot less. So it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit of, of regret. And you would dare say it's a little bit arty just going on the video. 
Is it? I like a bit of art, though. I'm like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I don't fall into that. You know, someone said to me the other day, I said like, oh, I'm just sat here having a having a read and drinking a cup of Earl Grey. Like Earl Grey, you changed. I went, I hope so. <laughs> I drink Earl Grey. It doesn't cost any more. You know, it's like yeah. I'm not allowed to drink Earl Grey because I, I just happen to like the tea. I didn't <laughs> I hate to hate it, but my wife got me into it. And it's like, and I'm like, I think I'm not changed. I'm still the person I am. But I'm like that with olives. Oh, I love olives. Oh, got right into olives. Uh, I used to be like, oh, they're posh, aren't they? Oh, they're rank. And then I've just, I've got right into them. Oh, I love them. I'm all the time. <laughs> yeah, so it's just ridiculous. It's like these things. That, it's like that. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm not going to get into politics, but that is it. Is it she, uh, from Stockport? Is it Angela? Is she Angela Rayner or something? Yeah, they're from uh, she, Ashton. From Ashton, where? Yeah, she's Ashton. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but she said something when she was in Parliament, some Tory MP said, oh, you call yourself a... Uh, an MP for the people. You went to the opera and she went, what, because I'm working class, I'm not allowed to go to the opera. And that's it in a nutshell. You know, yeah. you, you, you can. And maybe it's a bit, I like a bit of art. You know, the Velvet Underground were a massive influence. They were arty. You know, you can still be, John Lennon was arty. You know, mm. you can't, you can be arty and working class. You don't have to be scared of that. I just, I just, I just enjoyed it. The, it like, the, were they like, are they like ancient monuments and mixed in with the video and that kind of stuff? Is that? Oh, I just, it's, 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 it's you know, a guy called Adam White, who's a guy from, he's German, German Mancunian from Charlton. Okay. Uh, and he's kind of, and he, and he, he does photography, uh, Rourke Weiss photography. Or is it Weiss Rourke? I don't know, because his wife, uh, Martine's with yes. uh, niece. Uh, and I just, he just, I just said, I wanted this old kind of footage, that kind of 70s, Cine 8 kind of film that people have, you know, of parties, you know, in the 70s. And, and then he sent it. And I said, "Can you put more <laughs> gravestones in it?" When I first put the song, I did some footage walking around, like you know, the grave sound in in Toronto, just in just being a bit miserable. And, and I, but I like, I like that kind of stuff, you know, I like that yeah. that film noir kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I remember uh, one of my favorite videos is uh, the Smiths. I was he's now on the Queen. He's dead, you know. I, my brother was a Smiths fan. I was a Bunnymen fan. It was a lot of years later when I got into the Smiths through Andy Rock, who. Became in brother in law. I was into this, but I loved the videos. I was very bright, you know, and I loved all that kind of imagery and that kind of sex pistols were art. Christ, come on, you know, it, 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 people get mixed up with things, you know, that's I like a bit of that. And I think, I think music should have a little bit of art brought back into it. Yeah. Not too much, you don't have to be pompous and, you know, but, you know, yeah. I don't know. I like a bit of that. I like something a little bit more. There's a, there's a nice big riff in it. It ticks a lot of boxes. It's it, it, there's an excellent rhythm guitar. I, I in my when I were in a band years ago, I was a rhythm guitarist, so I, I uh, appreciate little different parts and that kind of makeup of a song. Um, so you tick all the boxes. Nice, lovely rhythm bit and a nice big riff at the end, mate. Yeah, that I don't play that. Mike B plays that thing. I had the oh, uh, I, I originally played it on the demo, nah, 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 nah. Uh, and very badly, and I put it, and it was on. <laughs> And the first, I've recorded the first part, I was recorded in, in Toronto with a guy who was Bernie Spears' guitarist, this Jamaican guy, Gilly Genesis, was great. And then I finished it off in, in Warrington at Tough Gong Studios, Latch. Yeah. And I said, I've not really done it very well, Mike, can you, and Mike just did it, you know, right? yeah. and he put wire on it, he just did it so well. And the intro picking he did as well, which is great. I know. But it kind of, it was, I wrote it last year, it was kind of one of the first songs I just wrote on my own, you know. So, uh, yeah, so that guitar link was I, I did it, but Mike Mike played it a lot better. Well, so we'll like put I, a, we'll put a link to the YouTube channel uh, within the description of this podcast and everything as well. We'll put obviously put a link to your tour that's coming up. But just before we move on to the tour, just to finish today, uh, when I were watching your interview with Nigel Carr from Louder Than War, he said you were yeah. you'd started a book and you, you you're probably going to be finished your book by October November. It's October November, mate. How's it coming on? It's not finished. I've been doing. I've okay. got stuff on this. It'll be, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what, Keith? I've not picked it up. I'm not, I, I did it. I did it. I've not touched it for a couple of months. I get kind of sidetracked with this. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And, and then I, um, my, my last computer died and all the files were on a hard drive. And uh -huh. All that kind of rubbish at that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it'll, it'll be done this year. I'm about three quarters away through it. And it's kind uh -huh. of a, it's just my perception. It's a coming of age story because I was 15 when I joined the band. It's just how I saw, you know, sitting at the back as a drummer as a 15 year old watching everything just. Uh -huh. Open up, open up, and I read it back, and, it, and a few people have read bits now. Like it's, it's quite funny. It's my my part of view of it, and, so, and seeing, you know, it was, it, as you can imagine, it was it was the thing about the band was it was hilarious. Paul Ryder and Paul Davis people play the two funniest people I've ever met. Just hilarious. The pair of them, just hilarious. the three of us are really close and just so funny. I mean, really, really funny. I mean, you think really looking funny. in from you know how, how much like the media people concentrate on what Sean and Bez do. 
Yeah. Uh, it, 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 I, 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 you naturally think that, you know, it might be them two that are the funny ones, but it, it's really interesting telling us who the real funny ones are, you know, behind the scenes of it all. Very different, yeah. Like, well, it's just that, you know, you get, I see a lot of stories, yeah, but the Mondays, some one this morning actually was quite funny. And it was, uh, it was me and Paul Ryder. I, I won't go into what it was. I got up to it, and it was in, it was in some article, and they put it as it was Sean and Bez, but it was actually me and Paul. Uh-huh. That's just what they made you do because they're, they're the, the, the famous ones on the front of it. So I understand that, you know, I don't, but and I don't, you know, that's the way it is. But that's what that's what's what happens, you know. People, you, you find it with lots of bands where. Oh, it was uh, uh, Morrissey or Janago. Well, actually, it was Mike Joyce and you did that. Way. But that's uh, that's just the nature of of, of the business of the show yeah. business. You know, it's just that, but yeah, no. Paul Davidson, Paul Ryder. LA, I mean, funniest people I've ever met in my life, and I've met some funny people, but them two on a different level. So the tour's coming then. So I'll just reel some dates off. Starts mm. on Saturday the twenty sixth of November in Berry, Wax and Beans. Then on to Bask in Stockport, Ben T- Ben Taylor's new bar, excellent bar. I've uh, been a few times. Yeah, everyone keeps saying that. Yeah, yeah. Class. Uh, Thursday, 1st of December, t- uh, Tils- Tildesley, Hop and Nasalwood. Uh, 2nd of December, Manchester at Lions Den. Sunday, 11th of December in Liverpool, phase one. Friday, 16th of December, Northwich, Salty Dog. So, what? So you know, a lot of, you know, a nice little chunk of gigs there, mate. You're looking forward to it. Yeah, Salty Dog in Northwich, not me now, because I couldn't, uh, oh. because of, Oh, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a problem with the times. Anyway, that so that was cancelled early on. I think right. very, very sold out. I think Liverpool, sorry, really well. Liverpool's a Sunday, and I think Stockport's a Sunday, so they'll probably be earlier, bit mm. earlier shows around the World Cup games as well. So, ah, uh, okay, right, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's eight quid, and you get like, you know, it'll, it'll be funny if anything. Just come down and laugh at me and take the piss yeah. if anything, if you don't like the music. But you know what? I like, and I, and I, and I said this on, on, on Twitter, and I'm really, really serious. If you really want to come down on your skin, just get in touch, and I'll get you in. You know, I just oh, you've, if it's a couple of views and you want someone, you know, like because if, if it's like say two of views and you want to bring your kids or something, you go well for four of us, that's sexy up to thirty six quid. You know what I mean? It, just just two of views now, put the kids on for three. So you know, come down because I'd rather people come. I'm not going to make any money out of this tour. It's going to cost me, but I don't want the promoters to lose. And I want it to be a good night and you know, and just get started. And I'm and, and, and I'm being honest about that. I'm not trying to be pseudo humble like that's the new thing as well now, isn't it? But <laughs> I'm being I'm being I'm trying to be, I'm being genuine, you know, and I just because. It'll be it'll be a laugh and but usually the Q and A, sadly the last one I did the Q and A, I ended up only oh, ended up doing about three or four Monday songs because the questions would just go on and people imagine what. Oh right, okay. lots of myths, them, lots of myths of the band, you know. But I'll, I'll make sure I get the songs in this time. But yeah, it usually ends up just a real laugh, you know, especially the Q and A, just goes on and, and the stories and you know it just goes off on a tangent, which is always quite funny. Any you- questions? Well, yeah, because I I went to see Alan McGee's last Q and A one, and it's just you know some of the questions that come up <laughs> must be a bit random for you. I know I know yeah. how can go. They must be quite entertaining. It's funny sometimes some myths. All this about one, I go, mm, yeah, there's kind of some truth in that, but that's not really true. All this <laughs> and usually, and actually, funny enough, the good thing is I would say that I expected most of the questions would be would be about drugs and what you want to do. And actually, most of them are about the songs, asking about where they come from. And uh, most of them. But either, I am happy to talk about either. But, you know, I, I would like to know where songs come from. There's a thing recently that fascinates me. Maybe that's because of a songwriter. But I remember, uh, I was talking about this again the other day. I was talking to Manny about it, funny enough. And I was saying, uh, there should be more people in bands talk about where the songs come from. Not... I don't like it when 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 people. This is another personal miserable moan. Yeah. Commudgeon is my middle name. You know, saying something like, uh, "Well, this song's about my, the emotions I felt during my, you know, my youth at time of university." You know, I don't like people to tell me what the songs are about because songs mean different to everybody else. You yeah. know what I mean? And I like that. But what's good years later when you hear where the idea came from? And there was one where, and he was of all people, Sting. Who everyone seemed to hate. I actually met him once. He was actually lovely. He was a uh, yeah, anyway, and, was, and he was stinging, he was talking about every breath you'd take, you know, that song. And he said it was about a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, brilliant, it just turns that song completely on yeah. its head. You know what I mean? And you, and you can, st- you know, and, and so I don't mind that. I just don't like people go, uh, I wrote, you know, you see singing song like this. This yeah. next one I wrote, I wrote when I was going through a, 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 a tough time during my, you know. No. This, is, this is a song I wrote when I was influenced by the uh, indigenous people, <laughs> of the, you know, thinking while I was travelling, you know, but... <laughs> You know, I can't really do with all that pompous nonsense. Yeah. But you know, when you so you people you mean different things to different people, you know what I mean? And but to where where the idea comes from mm. or the influence I find fascinating. 
And I don't think there's enough of that. So you're playing some, uh, so you're playing a mixture of Happy Monday songs and your songs then? Is that, is that, is that like yeah, how? Well, yeah, yeah, that, the electric set will probably be mostly, it's only going to be 25 minutes. Uh, my songs, a couple of Monday's electronics in there. I think I might do a hallelujah. Yeah. They, they, it'll be like the dance versions, you know, the remix yeah, version. Okay. Then you're going to sit down the, the Q&A with me and Mike, just acoustics. It'll just be pure Monday's songs then. Nice, nice. Well, um, I'm going to put a link to the shows, um, an updated list if there's a couple of them that have changed. Um, you know, grab yourself, click on the link, invest, come and see Gaz, and just have a great good night. I'm going to try and get to the Basque one myself, Gaz, I'm thinking. Well, you know what? It'll be it'll be good night just for, uh, like I say, just a bit of fun. The bat, I've got, I've got, I've got uh, Chris Payne, a photographer, who plays a little bit of saxophone, going to come to the gig on stop. I said, oh, just get up and play sax. He went, well, on, on what? On what? I went, just go up and jam. Don't yeah. just take it too serious. If it comes up and it's a mess, it's a mess. It's a laugh, laugh, laugh of the crowd. We'll finish the song and go, well, that was shit, weren't it? You know what I mean? Should we do it again? And, you know, let's not be too pompous about it. You know, have a bit of yeah. fun. You know what I mean? And it is, it's going to be a bit of a laugh. But if you want to just come down and take the piss out of me, do that. Fair dues, fair dues. And I don't, really, I don't really mean that. I'm too sensitive. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I'm a sensitive musician. Come on, don't, but you know, <laughs> not me. don't you know, you know what I'm saying? Well, Gaz, mate, really appreciate your time this evening. Get yourself back into that weather and go and have a drink with Manny tonight down in Barbados somewhere. He's, 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 yeah, he's, I got a mess of him before saying, you know, because I said, oh, I feel a bit rough. He went, well, you know, uh, the manicure, get back on it, you know. So, <laughs> never ends. Never ends. It, so he'll, he'll, yeah, yeah. Mate, really appreciate your time, Gaz. Uh, have a lovely time. Have a great tour. Good, All the links in the description of this podcast. Thanks again for your time, mate. Appreciate it. Take care, mate. See you later, <laughs> mate.